Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Jobs. 140,000 new jobs in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, when at its peak prior to this administration, unemployment in our state was at 9.2 percent, and it has been lowered to 6.9 percent, a five-year low. Jobs. We made a significant difference in the private sector job creation in this state. Refineries in the Philadelphia were saved. 2,200 direct jobs, 15,000 ancillary jobs because of the work that this administration and colleagues on both sides of the aisle brought with Brascom, Delta, and Sun to save those refineries. And we did do business tax reform in closing the Delaware loophole. But we also made common sense changes that other states have done for years. Changes to the net operating loss, going to single sales, they're technical in nature, but they matter to real employers and to real employees with family sustaining jobs. In our Pittsburgh area, United States Steel did a $500 million expansion. And Hershey, here in the mid-state, did an over $300 million expansion, both attributable to the business tax reform that we worked on with members from both sides of the aisle. And with respect to energy consumption, natural gas, a cleaner fossil fuel, we're developing it here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania with the strictest regulations across this country, but at the same time in a balanced manner. And those lower energy costs, they matter to consumers, people at their homes, when they cook when they use their hot water, when they use the dryer, but it also matters to manufacturers. And so a place like Procter & Gamble decides to stay in Northeastern Pennsylvania and expand because we have been proactive in our energy policy and not reactive. Jobs, a family-sustaining job, is what most and each and every citizen wants to take care of their families and to contribute to their communities. If you have good job climate, you'll have good schools and good communities. Education. I applaud the governor and I applaud the bipartisan work on education in this chamber. Every year since the governor has taken office, we have increased state dollars for public education for K through 12. It went from the last year under Governor Rendell at 8.89 billion up to 9.3 billion in the first term of Governor Corbett, then to 9.7 billion, then to 9.9 billion, and in this proposed budget exceeds 10 billion dollars. 10 billion dollars in public education K through 12. But keep in mind, we've been focused on the kids. So we've been trying to get more out of every tax dollar that's spent. We're fiscal stewards. We're responsible to those citizens. And on two fronts, I think that the governor made an important point. The accountability block grants, which have real requirements of our schools to hit performance goals was started under the speaker and it's expanded this year to 341 million dollars and i think that's a step in the right direction in making sure that those taxpayer dollars are well spent in terms of our educational system and keep in mind we think that all kids deserve a chance and that means strong public schools but it also means that it's not one size fits all and so in a bipartisan manner, this chamber voted to double the educational improvement tax credits and to provide a subset of those dollars to students in school districts where they're not performing, where they're not meeting the mark. Those have been steps in the right direction. Teacher evaluations, compromises were reached. 
The goal meaning that we want the best public school teachers to be able to be successful in every school district, no matter what their, their communities and issues that they deal with. I can tell you, as a son of a public school teacher and a brother of a public school teacher, we want them to succeed and to do well because it's about the kids. And we want to make sure that those that need alternatives have those alternatives to reach their full potential. With respect to health care, I applaud the governor. I applaud this chamber. I think there is a desirability, a common sense desirability, to find middle ground. And I think healthy PA hits the mark. The private sector, the private sector has been delivering quality health care in this country and in this state in a very, very effective manner, but it needs to be improved. And the way it's improved is to make use of that private sector so that those who do not have employer-based health care, like the members here do, although we are now contributing to it since we took back to the majority, we need to make sure that that option's available. And I'm sorry, but I am not convinced, I am not convinced that the private sector approach, the market-based approach, is not going to be approved as Pennsylvania's approach. And I continue to see that the governor is taking great strides to bring that to fruition. I think healthy PA makes sense, including common sense medical malpractice reforms. And I think that the CHIP program, the CHIP program for our children, which we started, is a crucial component part of making sure that we continue to have a healthy PA for all of our citizens. Under Chairman Mikosi's legislation, who worked with Chairman DeLuca, we saw children have to wait six months before their coverage would start, and we got rid of that requirement. Children came first. And we want to make sure that the CHIP program remains solvent and steady with respect to any changes that we do moving forward. I want to also say that it has been, in many ways, an outstanding session, and we have put important pieces of legislation on our counterpart's desk across the Capitol. And we have done it with bipartisan support. We hope that they get over the goal line and onto the governor's desk. In House Bill 1189, property tax relief on a local level, that received 149 votes here, bipartisan support, before being sent over to the Senate. And House Bill 618, where we in fact make sure that we do not overspend on the cyber charters, that that money returns back to our school districts, but at the same time promotes brick and mortar charters in those areas that have had students failing, 50% of the kids not graduating, that those school choice options are available. And remember, those, those charter schools, those brick and mortar charters are public schools. And the Educational Improvement Tax Credit Program, which we doubled with bipartisan support, over 140 votes, allows those children that are going to Catholic schools or Christian schools or other private schools and those that go to public schools to be able to get scholarships if that's where their families think those kids will grow best. But I want to reiterate this point. In this proposed budget, we are spending over $10 billion, more than 40% of the budget, on public education K through 12. And that is designed to make sure that each and every child in this Commonwealth has an opportunity to become what she or he wants. That's a success story. So I must say, I think the record has been good, and I think there's more to do in terms of private sector job creation. Jobs, family sustaining jobs, are at the hallmark of what we have been working together to accomplish in Pennsylvania. Education, common sense reforms, 
increase funding while protecting the taxpayers, being good fix fiscal stewards. It's been a balance, but that's our job to make those policy balances. And it's been successful, and we can do more. Healthy PA. Many of the bills already passed, including the elimination of the waiting requirement for CHIP. And I think that the call for increased funding, like we did last time, for those with intellectual disabilities, well over a billion, $1.3 billion in the budget, $1.3 billion in the budget, a significant increase to eliminate the waiver. I think it's important because for a fiscal stewardship, we also have to have compassion and we have to meet the needs of those who suffer from those, hand, who suffer from those disabilities and can in fact be contributing members of society. It's a balance, and it's a positive balance. I think also with respect to energy policy, we need to finish up our work on Chapter 14 under Chairman Godshall in bipartisan, overwhelming bipartisan support, House Bill 939, which renewed the Chapter 14 reforms, and House Bill 1047, which did updates but also improved some protections for low-income citizens. Those important reforms sit over in the Senate and they need to get over the goal line like other pieces of legislation to get to the governor's desk. Just by way of example, the Philadelphia Gas Works, which many thought was going to go bankrupt, went from 84% collectability to 96% collectability and now has a valuation of close to $2 billion. These changes that we've done to promote jobs, reforms in education, reforms to health care, increased transparency and accountability to this chamber and all branches of government, they are significant successes. We need to build on those. It is clear that we must do public pension reform. That is true for new hires. We need to honor our deals, our agreements with existing retirees, with existing employees. But with respect to new hires, we need to make sure that there are changes to bring us into the 21st century, just like the private sector has done since the mid-90s. Our, ta our taxpayers expect nothing less of us. And with respect to moving into the 21st century, we all know that there have to be significant changes to the liquor reform system and even to the Turnpike Commission, which I know has already made some changes, but we need to do both with those antiquated governmental bodies because it's what the taxpayers are expecting. Now, I will end on this note. I, I, there's one piece of legislation that many of you had the courage in a bipartisan fashion to send over to the Senate, and that's to lead by example. We passed the Speaker's constitutional amendment to reduce the size of the House of Representatives from 203 to 153 members and a separate bill to reduce the size of the Senate. It is apparent that this is not a body and that we do not have members that are thinking about just themselves. We are a body that is thinking about the citizens of Pennsylvania. And we've been able to make tough policy decisions, but important policy decisions because I have seen in so many members that we have worked with on the Republican and Democratic side of the aisle to make significant changes. People are not, nor have they been, about returning themselves to office, but about making the important decisions that will best suit generations to come in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Chairman Markosik, Leader Dermody, as always on many pieces of legislation, and to the individual members, because it's not hierarchical here, it's about working together. We invite all of you to be part of the budgetary process, and we look forward to the hearings that are about to begin, and know that we are going to have the fourth budget done on time and responsibly govern, respecting the needs of the citizens of Pennsylvania, but balancing them against the pocketbooks of the taxpayer.
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker.